Lord Peter Hayne joins us now via Zoom to share his journey of fighting this scourge. Uh, to this day, he's in London. Uh, Lord Peter Hayne, thanks very much indeed for joining us and uh, welcome to the programme. Good to be with you and see you again, Peter. Yeah, it's, it's been quite a journey for you, lifelong really, in terms of uh, fighting racism. And uh, when we think about uh, this struggle that you had in the 1970s to cancel this uh, uh, Springbok tour, um, some might say not much has changed, sadly, over time. No, a lot has changed. Mm -hmm. I mean, in those days, in 1969-70, when we were running on the pitch at Twickenham to physically block the Springboks playing, Danny Craven, then the rugby supremo of South Africa, said, over my dead body, would there ever be a black Springbok? Mm -hmm. Well, last November, Sio Khaleesi lifted the World Club in, up in that glorious victory over England, and South Africa were champions, and here's a township boy whom Danny Craven would never have imagined being yeah. a Springbok, captaining the side, uh, containing a lot of his fellow township boys as well. So a lot has changed. That would never have been possible under right. apartheid. In fact, the law, apartheid, uh, legislated against anybody who wasn't white representing their country, whether it was in rugby or cricket. So a lot has changed. But um, at the same time, as the Black Lives Matter protests have made clear, a lot still has to change, and that's mm. true in South Africa as well. All right, so tell us some of the things that you've seen in South Africa. I think you uh, pointed out that the Proteas perhaps missed an opportunity to bend the knee in their series against uh, England. Yes, to be honest, I was astonished that of all the countries given South Africa's tortured apartheid history, which infested sport right the way up from school level, where I, as a schoolboy in Pretoria, was unable to play with or against anybody who didn't have a white skin, to club level, to provincial level, to national level, apartheid infested South African sport. And therefore, the fact that the Proteas didn't actually lead the world or at least join the world in taking the knee when Formula One driver Lewis Hamilton led his fellow drivers to take the knee on the front row of the grid at a series of races now since um, the middle of the year. And when uh, British Premiership soccer teams all take the knee at the start to make it clear that racism is unacceptable in sport, where, where it has been very rife not, I'm not talking about South Africa particularly, but right across Europe and the United States, we've seen that repeatedly. I just thought the Proteas should have actually got there and, uh, and, and taken the knee as well. Mm. And given also when you know, in 1970, we stopped that all white cricket tour led by Ali Bakker. It was the first blow against apartheid in sport of that kind. And white South African cricketers never came to England again until after Nelson Mandela walked out of prison and uh, became president. And the same was true in Australia, which followed a year after us. So, so on the one hand, a lot has changed, but there should have been, I would have thought, in the yeah. DNA of the Proteas. It's not for me to say what individual cricketers should or shouldn't do. That's for them. But with other sports people, across the world taking a stand against uh, racism, I, I would have thought some leadership should have occurred from cricket in mm. South Africa and other sports too. What do you think it is? Is it a failure to read the temperature or not fully understanding that this global story actually is something that affects us still? Um, what might it be, do you think? Well, look, I'm not involved in the detail, yeah. but my fellow co-author, uh, Andre Woodendahl, South Africa's leading sports historian and involved in cricket as former CEO of the Cape Cobras. Uh, he is involved in, in all of this. And uh, I, I, I just find it astonishing that very old fashioned semi apartheid attitudes were expressed by members of South African cricket uh, as if they hadn't really moved with the times and hadn't yeah. understood the extent of the transformation in. South Africa and hadn't understood the critical importance of um, 
Black Lives Matter. I mean, just just imagine that when John Carlos and Tommy Smith, the American Olympic gold medalists and medalists, silver medalists, uh, stood on the podium in 1968. This is 52 years ago and more, and uh, did the, uh, lifted their hands in the Black Power salute. They were punished. Lewis Hamilton, Formula One's serial champion, the best driver in the history of the sport, uh, lifted his hand in a Black Power salute only a few months ago when he won a race yet again. It shows the extent of the change, mm -hmm. and yet South Africa is, in cricket at least, seems to be with a yeah. turmoil in the sport, seems not to be moving with the times. So your book, uh, Pitch Battles, Sports, Racism and Resistance, what do we learn from that? I mean, this is a lifetime of lessons for you. Well, it is, because I've been involved in the whole question for a, a half a century. Uh, from the time when I initiated and led a campaign to physically stop the Springboks and succeeded in stopping the then equivalent of the Proteas playing in uh, in England and Wales. And uh, that that was born out of experiencing a apartheid in cricket and a apartheid in rugby and soccer at first hand as a boy and seeing it, it the way it worked in South Africa and then being determined after Basil de Oliveira the great coloured cricketer from Cape Town who couldn't represent his own country under apartheid, uh, couldn't even play first-class club or provincial uh, cricket, and had to come to England to become a member of the England Test team in order to re reach his full potential. So there was all of that background. And then the struggles inside the country, uh, led by, on the one hand, domestically, the South African Council of Sports, SACOS, and on the other hand, the South African Non-Racial Olympic Committee, brave uh, sports leaders like uh, Dennis Brutus, uh, who'd served prison in Robben Island, of course, Chris De Brolio, and John Harris, who was the only white to be hung in the freedom struggle in 1965. Uh, and he'd been a chair of Sanrock. Uh, these people were pioneers of the struggle inside uh, South Africa. And my co-author, Andre Wood, and I'll, I'll in the 80s was one of those activists as well. Uh, and so, um, you know, we've jointly written this book to tell our own stories mm -hmm. through our own lives of our involvement, but particularly to focus on the untold story going right the way back to the, uh, the 19th century in, under British colonial rule of the way in which racism was embedded in cricket and in rugby and in soccer from a very early stage under British rule. And then, of course, intensified dramatically and got institutionalized under a apartheid. And beyond that, Peter, we tell the story in the book, and a lot of this history has not been uh, written before or, or been in a book such as ours. We also shine a light on global sport and on whether it's the big money at the top or the inequality down below, whether it's the battles for gender equality led by the American football, women's football captain, Megan Rapino, or other battles for equality, including ridding sport of racism, which has haunted uh, sport globally and, uh, of course, notably in South Africa, but globally now for generations. All right. So um, how, do we, how do we embrace a book like this, understanding the history and perhaps some of the mentality that was at play? How do we embrace that in a modern era? Uh, as you say, we're seeing a lot of progress made and a lot of people taking action. Uh, but how do we change attitudes so that it becomes commonplace to be, to be horrified that, that we see it from time to time? Well, I think everybody has to step up to, mm. the, to the mark. Mm. And everybody has to follow the lead of the Lewis Hamiltons and the Colin Copernics. Of course, Colin being taking the knee in protest against racism and in protest against uh, um, uh, discrimination in America four years ago and being punished and virtually sacked as a result. And John Carlos and Tommy Smith similarly back in 1968 for their Black Power salute. So sport has come a long way. Mm. You get the Lewis Hamiltons and the Raheem Sterlings and the Marcus Rashfords, the 
the great British footballers leading the way. And I expect that to be happening in South Africa as well. And I expect white uh, cricketers as well as black cricketers to be providing a lead to say that South Africa stands proud with the Black Lives, Lives Matter protests. Um, so I, I hope that uh, people will read the history because yeah. we're all a product of history. Yeah. South Africa, if anything, more than most because of the apartheid legacy that still infests the country. So that, for example, when we all uh, were absolutely struck in awe by the way Sio Khaleesi led that Springbok team to victory last November in the World Cup, uh, just a little over a year ago, the Rugby World Cup. We also must recognize that the, the, the Springbok players from the townships yeah. like him, and he'd never had a full meal a day every day when he was plucked uh, as a talented young player uh, from that background and went to school in, in Grays in Port Elizabeth, that those other Springbok players uh, from the townships had that similar route. And there are lots of other potential Springboks in the townships out there, and they should be given a chance to come out of that uh, poverty and inequality as well. So there's a big argument and a yeah. big change still to happen in South Africa, and that's true right across the world as well. All right. So what do you say to people who say, hang on, politics should be left off the field and out of sport? Well, I say, first of all, apartheid in the battles of 50 years ago and more recently inside South Africa and in the campaigns that I was part of, apartheid ejected politics into sport by refusing Basil de Oliveira the ability to represent his country and the Sio Khaleesi's of those uh, that age half a century ago the chance to play for the Springboks because there was an edict that they couldn't. Uh, so um, apartheid introduced politics into sport. And really, the idea that sport should somehow be exempt from politics is like saying sport should be exempt from life, that it should be impervious to moral questions and questions of human rights and equality, whether on grounds of gender or race or any other factor that divides people and creates inequalities. Sport is a very, very important important part of uh, life globally. I mean, hundreds and hundreds of millions of people across the, the globe watch the British Premier League. Uh, hundreds of millions watch Lewis Hamilton race in Formula One. The World Cup was watched by hundreds of millions. It's a big, big part of our lives, and it's got us to step up to the mark and, and stand for, for decent values. Unfortunately, there are sports leaders and sports stars, the Lewis Hamiltons and the Marcus Rashfords and the, the Raheem Sterlings and others who are doing that. And I think that should be the case in South Africa as well, because sports stars are very, very powerful in today's uh, world where media coverage is uh, you know, universal and, and massive on sport and where the average person who doesn't really care for politics, follows sport and is a sports fan and, and expects leadership from their idols. Lord Peter Hain, always a pleasure talking to you and we certainly look forward to enjoying your book, Pitch Battles, Thanks. Sports, Racism and Resistance. Thanks so much.